Welcome, Dr. Barbara Rothbaum, to the show. Thank you. I'm very happy to be here. It's wonderful to have you. I've um, kind of been following as a, as a psychiatrist the emergence of virtual reality for a while now, and uh, it's it's just a delight to get to speak with one of the pioneers here. I want to thank you for your, your work. Thank you. Yeah, we published... It was the first published study using virtual reality to treat a psychiatric or psychological disorder, and we published it in 1995. So wow. we've been doing this for a little while. <laughs> well, it's a long time, yeah, and it, it, it takes time in, uh, in medicine to move things forward. Right. Conventional so. wisdom is about 20 years, so we're, we're pretty much there. <laughs> Beautiful. A little, a little past there. <laughs> Well, for our audience who may not be as familiar with VR, who aren't up to date yet on uh, where things are at this point in its application for therapy, can you just um, give us an update and let us know where we are today? Um, sure. First, I want to talk about what actual VR is, because a lot of people kick around and they'll call a lot of things virtual reality or VR. VR is an interactive computer environment. And, but what's special about it is that the user experiences a sense of presence, <clears throat> excuse me, in that environment. So for example, I could take a picture of the room I'm in and you could get a sense of the room. I could take a video of the room I'm in and you could get a little bit better sense of the room, but you wouldn't feel present in it. And if I had it rendered in virtual reality, you know, within 20 seconds, that would be your reality and you would feel present. It's a 360 degree environment. You could crawl under my desk. You could, you know, move all around in it. We outfit users in a head mounted display, which is basically like a, a strappy helmet with two television screens in front of each eye, earphones and a position tracker. So just as my view changes when I move my head in reality, so it does in virtual reality. We also have a couple of other, I call them tricks. The computer scientists don't like it when I call them tricks. For example, um, for most of our environments, we have people sitting on a raised platform with a woofer or base shaker underneath. So for example, in the virtual airplane, you feel the vibration of the airplane, you feel the landing gear coming up, you can feel turbulence. For many environments, we have you know, basically a joystick or a game pad that you can maneuver yourself or the virtual environment. For example, um, you could, in the early one, manipulate a virtual hand to push the mm -hmm. elevator button. And in ones we have now, you can drive the Humvee in the virtual Iraq and Afghanistan. So that's a, that's a long answer to tell you what VR is. Great. And then how... I've got so many questions from what you just said, but I'm going to try to stay on track here with my thinking. Um, how do you... Uh, so other than... Can you tell us about the applications in therapy um, and how it's being used today? Right. And, and there are a number of applications out there, and it's really almost just limited by people's imagination and the computer mm -hmm. programmers to create it. We have a virtual Iraq and Afghanistan, and I run the Emory Healthcare Veterans Program. And so we will use it for exposure therapy with veterans, and we've done a number of studies with it as well. Probably my favorite environment is the virtual airplane because I live in Atlanta. Um, I'm assuming most people, if you have flown, have flown through the Atlanta airport. I actually love it. I can get almost anywhere in the world in one flight. Not lately, not during COVID, but, um, and so, but it was a real pain before VR if I had a patient who was scared of flying. If I really had to go to the airport, you know, you've got to get through Atlanta traffic. You've got to arrange a stationary airplane. You've got to arrange all the security to, to be able to get through. And with the virtual airplane, 
we can take off and land as many times as we need to all within the 45, 50 minute therapy session and without leaving my office. So that's my favorite. Um, we've got them for fear of public speaking. We've got them for fear of storms, um, for like spiders, small animals. Um, and I also want to disclose I'm full time at Emory. I'm a professor in psychiatry, but Years ago, when we published this study, Emory and Georgia Tech thought there might be a marketable product, and they literally took us by the hand to a lawyer to incorporate, and that's virtually better. So I'm a part owner and virtually better. Like I said, although I'm, I'm full-time at Emory, always like to disclose that. That's great. Wow. And I'm curious with regard to, um, I mean, that's such a great example of how much easier it is for patients to access treatment for fear of flying um, rather than having to do all the things that you just listed off and, and getting there. And I, I, I can add, I mean, the other advantage is that the therapist has complete control over hmm. what you're presenting to the patient. So when my patient is ready for turbulence, I can guarantee there'll be turbulence. Mm. If my patient's not ready for turbulence, I can guarantee there won't be turbulence. So you really do have complete control. That's one of the really important things about, I think, in my experience with trauma therapy, to expose people in a titrated way and to be able to have control over the titration, I think, is what you're talking about. Right. Yeah. Beautiful. Yeah. And with, you know, with um, PTSD in war veterans, for example, you can control the intensity with the volume. Or if they say, we heard gunfire far away, the easy way to do that in virtual reality is turn the volume down. So it's a, it's, it is a way to titrate it. Hmm. And so um, at this point, outside of specific phobias and PTSD, um, are there, I'm just curious, are there people applying VR in other conditions like uh, mood disorders or um, other, other situations people deal with? Absolutely. People have been using it for depression. I think Chris Bruin in um, England has been using it for depression. People are using it for substance use disorders. Um, and it's really cool for that because, for example, you can expose your patient to the cues, but in a mm. safe environment. You want wow. to teach them, you know, for example, drug refusal skills, tools without being on the corner when someone's actually holding drug in their hand and, and the consequences are greater if they don't get the refusal skills quite right. Um, so that's a good one. Um, we use it for relaxation. People use it for distraction, especially during painful techniques. Um, so people have been using it for a number of different disorders. Hmm. And is there, um, would you say that, um, the problem of COVID and, and telemedicine, teletherapy, does it seem to you like that's accelerated, um, the adoption of VR or the, the, the use of VR, any sense of that? Well, for us, it's actually interfered. Um, so I'd hmm. love telemedicine. And when COVID hit, we pivoted our veterans program to be able, because right now we fly veterans in from all around the United States and put them up for two weeks and, and treat them every day. Um, we pivoted to telemedicine and it's working just as well. But for, if you remember going back to my original definition of VR, for it to be real VR, it needs to be immersive. Um, so for us, that means being present you know, in the room with us and, and wearing the, the virtual reality head-mounted display. So people are talking about doing VR over telemedicine. And my impression is that it's not real VR. And doing research, I try to be precise in my language and and not call it virtual reality if it's not it might be an um, a multimedia display you know there there are plenty of other things that it could be that are are cool and effective but in my mind it's probably not immersive VR so Barbara it sounds like a lot of it was a lot of your focus with trauma is that where your, a lot of your focus has been 
Um, well, anxiety and trauma, and I do a lot of exposure therapy. So that's how the, the virtual reality came up. The um, computer scientist, there was an Emory Georgia Tech seed grant. So you needed a Georgia Tech investigator and an Emory investigator. So the computer scientist called me up and I said, you want to do what? <laughs> and, he, and he makes fun of me still because I asked him to send me his CV to make sure he was legitimate. But this was this was in the early 90s. Um, and he needed an exposure therapist. And we originally talked about doing it with fear of public speaking. But at that time, people move in arts. And at that time, virtual reality didn't do arts of people really well. It, it worked better in straight lines. And so we, we switched to the fear of heights because the height cues could be rendered really well in VR. I'm curious about... For me, like when I hear, you know, anxiety and phobias, like to me, that's like sort of somewhat simple in terms of like you create the VR world that deals with the phobia. Um, it seems like it might get a lot more delicate in the range of what traumas could be and what the actual event was and what actually went down, if there was physical or sexual abuse or how. Um, tell me what you've learned here about using VR for trauma and different types of traumas and what what are you doing there yeah well keith that's probably exactly why like the fear of flying is my favorite vr app um i i like it for ptsd and we've used it for the war veterans because i think it is such a potent stimulus that it's harder to avoid and ptsd is a disorder of avoidance but you're exactly right that for ptsd so i do a lot of imaginal exposure, prolonged exposure, PE. And in that, we ask people to go back in their mind's eye, to close their eyes, and to picture it and describe the traumatic event in the present tense as if it's happening now. So I'm driving back to base, Jones is next to me, Smith is in the turret. We hear a loud explosion, IED blast hits on the right side, everything fills with smoke, and we go through it over and over. Now, we can exactly recreate that in virtual reality. Um, and I, again, I like it, especially for the veterans, because and we started it the first time we used VR for war trauma. It, we created a virtual Vietnam. Um, so this was at the end of the 90s. And at that point, I know I'm pivoting a little bit. I'll come back. At that point, the Vietnam veterans had been in the system for a long time. It was already several decades since the war. And if they were still in the system, they were pretty much treatment resistant. And so we thought, let's try the VR and see, you know, if it can help. And, and it did. Um, so when we applied it to the younger veterans from Iraq and Afghanistan, we've done it in a couple of different studies. And it has been effective. As I mentioned, PTSD is a disorder of avoidance. And I think war veterans are particularly avoidant because they're trained in it. You don't want someone to have a big emotional response in a war zone. You want them to compartmentalize and just do what they're trained to do. But then sometimes it's hard to put the emotions back together with the memory and with the experience. And so that's part of why I like the VR. It's so potent. And everybody pays so much attention to the visuals. I actually think it's the sounds that, that really get people. And, and they know it. In earlier versions, we didn't have all the right um, artillery or, you know, all of the aircraft. Um, and so, you know, matching the sounds is important. And that's coming back to your question. If it doesn't match the memory, then it can be, it can take them out of it. Um, and that's why, you know, prolonged imaginal exposure, PE works so well because it's it's their own memory. And that's what we train new therapists in. If the patient's doing well, we're counting it, just get out of their way and let them do it. You know, if you say the wrong thing, it can take them out of it. It can interfere. So with PTSD, it's such an individual. We're exposing them to the memory of their trauma that in general, I'm, I don't feel like VR adds a lot. But when it's something like in war, like Iraq or Afghanistan or Vietnam, there are so many common stimuli that are triggering just because they're there. So for you and I, if you haven't served, we could see them 
and they wouldn't be particularly emotional for us. But anyone who served, and especially if you've got PTSD, just the stimuli are going to be evocative and help put you back there. So I like it for that reason and when we can use common stimuli. Well, um, we have done a study with military sexual trauma survivors with PTSD, and we use VR. We do not present the perpetrator. We're just are presenting these external stimuli, for example, the environments where it might have occurred. We've got a vehicle, we've got a motel room, we've got a barracks, we've got a FOB, a forward operating base, we've got a latrine in the showers. We've got, you know, we've got these situations and the person is describing what happened to them, but immersed in this stimuli that matches where it happened. And so we think that that's effective. But we haven't so used it for, for some other trauma. And, and so you never, um, if we're talking about sexual trauma um, for the moment, it, it sounds like you would never actually have mock perpetrators within the VR environment. You're really just going to work with the stimuli without a, a person in the environment. Is that right? Yes and no. That's how I use it. So the, the virtual... Iraq and Afghanistan that we use for the military sexual trauma, Dr. Skip Rizzo and his group at USC and the ICT, Institute for Creative Technologies, developed it. Um, and so they, there is a perpetrator that you can use. And, and the therapist has a, a computer screen where we can include audio stimuli, put them in the different environments, you know, make things appear and disappear. But my group, so there, there is one in the virtual environment. My group never, ever uses it. Actually, I'm going to take that back. We used it once um, because the person we were treating was now working with the perpetrator. And we used it in role-playing in case they came into contact with the perpetrator now in the environment and just being able to, you know, talk or not talk or pass. So not not presenting the perpetrator as an assailant. But so that's the only time I can think that mm -hmm. we've actually used the perpetrator. Um, we don't for a lot of reasons. One, and this is more my philosophy. Other people have different philosophies. In virtual reality, I don't want to present anyone with anything that would be naturally threatening to anyone. That's why I said, you know, we would see, you know, driving the Humvee in Iraq and, you know, maybe it'd be cool, but it wouldn't necessarily be threatening to us. Um, but they would feel threatened right away if you've got PTSD from that environment. Um, so we want to present things that are threatening basically because they're conditioned stimuli. So uh, a perpetrator, an assailant, is going to be naturally threatening to anyone. So that's kind of more of a almost almost like a moral or ethical stance, I guess, that I take. Um, the other is, as I said earlier, if it doesn't match, then it can take the person out of the memory. And it's very unlikely that we're going to match the perpetrator. And it's better. Right. They've got a picture in their mind. You know, I think it's better for them to do that. This is also the same reason. And again, in some of the environments, Skip and, and his developers have injuries and blood present. I don't show it. And our folks don't show it for the same reasons. Anyone would respond to that. And it's not likely to match. But we do ask people in their mind's eye to describe the injuries and, and in a lot of detail. It makes sense to me that you would um, really focus on eliciting the conditioned response and, and not um, eliciting a, a healthy fight or flight response to a uh, threatening stimulus. It makes a lot of sense. Um, I'm wondering, um, and this, pardon my ignorance here, I'm just so curious about this technology. Are there um, formats where the therapist also has an avatar inside the VR and... Um, you're interacting with your patient in the virtual environment together? Um, we don't do that. Um, but um, there are things like Second Life, um, which, again, is not real VR. 
Um, but um, there are things like that that the therapist does occupy an avatar and, and interacts. What our patients say, because they're going through it, we're seeing everything that they're seeing um, and we're in the room with them. And um, some of our patients say things like, I feel like you're riding shotgun with me, you know, mm-hmm. like, like you're there. Mm-hmm. So you're interacting um, outside of the V in your model, you're in inter- with real VR. <laughs> it's an important distinction. I'm glad you clarified that, yeah. that you're, you're, you're interacting verbally with them. Um, and would you maybe ask them to describe what they see or what are they feeling or they know that you're there, they can feel your presence, even though you're not in the VR. Right. And it is essentially, if you are familiar with PE, with prolonged exposure, mm-hmm. it's essentially prolonged exposure, but with your eyes open and saying it out loud and us presenting what you're describing in the VR. So like I said, you know, a fairly common trauma that we'll work with in our Iraq and Afghanistan veterans is getting hit by an IED um, when when they're driving, say, a Humvee. So they describe it, you know, heading back to base now. It's September 6th, sun setting. So we can recreate all of that. We can have the sun setting. You know, I'm driving. Jones is next to me. Smith is in the turret. We can put people, we can populate the vehicle exactly as they describe not with the names but we can put someone in the passenger seat we can put people in the back seat we can put someone in the turret we can put them in a humvee or an mrap if for example there's an explosion and they get out of the vehicle we can have them get out of the vehicle and then they can walk using the joystick say to the other vehicle we can present the explosion wherever it is we can present fire we can have insurgents we can have trash on the side of the road Mm -hmm. it can be in a city it can go through a village they can be on foot patrol in a middle eastern Mm -hmm. city almost everything that they could describe from Iraq or Afghanistan, we can recreate in virtual reality. Do you think that the um, improvement or the enhancement in in the technology and the sort of, um, I, what's the right word, um, sort of uh, the graphics, um, do you think that the improvements in the quality of the environment over, over a couple decades has improved outcomes in from uh, the treat the VR exposure treatments or do you think um, the technology is just uh, allowing you to have more control over the you know presenting the stimulus to folks in, in a more kind of realistic way yeah so actually I don't think that the improved computer graphics, is related to outcome. I mean, and this is, you know, decades ago, why the computer scientist was interested in it. Obviously, I was interested in, you know, another another form of treatment, another way. And also, I mean, just making treatment feasibly more more accessible. You know, for example, air flying is going to be expensive for the patient because insurance isn't going to cover everything. It's going to be really time consuming. You know, if I'd had to go right. to the airport, if I had to fly with someone, if I can do it all in 45 minutes and insurance pays for it, it's just more accessible. It's feasibly easier. Um, but the computer scientists were more interested in what are the cues mm-hmm. that are necessary to make people or help people feel a sense of presence. And so that's part of what we think about when exposure therapy, you know, because we mm-hmm. want people to feel in some ways present with what they're dealing with because we want their arousal up there. I I think in terms of there's this, and it's theoretical, an optimal level of arousal when we're doing exposure therapy. We don't want someone so relaxed. They're not going to learn. It's not going to access anything. We don't want someone having so much anxiety that they're not even processing or what you're saying or, or learning more. Um, And now I forgot your original question. All right. No problem. We were we were exploring the question of whether better computer graphics and right. uh, really, it sounds like what you're saying is that essentially, um, what I'm gathering from what you're saying is that exposure therapy is highly effective and it's sort of like, how do you deliver it? And to the extent that VR and computers can help deliver, it's really more about the exposure therapy itself. 
Is that right? Yes. Uh-huh. And um, when you when you know what frightens people and you can present it in any format, in this case in VR, and you access that, then they feel present because the fear and the anxiety helps them feel present with it. Um, So early on, when we were creating the first virtual airplane, the computer scientist is rubbing his hands and he says, you know, we can crash this thing. It's like, no, you don't get the idea. (laughs) And when I was demoing the the first ones, there was too much room between the, the passenger seat and the window. It felt too roomy. And, you know, what I was explaining to him is folks with the fear of flying about half of them have the fear of crashing. And that's when he said, we can crash this thing. And about half of them have the more claustrophobic fear. So you really, you want it to be tight. You want it to, to feel like a real airplane and, and to be claustrophobic. And as long as you tap into those fear cues, then it really doesn't have to be too realistic. Now, everybody, I mean, you know, we've got Zoom, we've got, you know, people have computer games. So people have an expectation, you know, of a certain level of graphics. And so it's really more for that than, um, than that I think it really matters to the efficacy of treatment. You know, it's just the attractiveness and also the, the bells and whistles, you know, what, what therapists are able to present and control. How far has VR been taken in the, in the therapy field in terms of, um, like it, it seems like it's mostly been used in more of these cognitive therapies, cognitive behavioral therapies. Like, has it actually been taken into, are people exploring using it in other types of work, like more exploring psychodynamically your, your childhood or more exploring like parts work of your psyche or like, like, is it mostly at this point, like a cognitive behavioral intervention? Most that I'm aware of. Is, is more CBT, and it really is amenable to, to CBT, although people are working with the different formats that they can, for example, represent, you know, I think a little bit, Will, like you were talking about earlier, Keith, represent the therapist and then kind of make their mouth move <laughs> in a... In a um, to me, sounds a little freaky, <laughs> like those old pictures that the eyes would move. <laughs> um, right. But yeah, I think it's mostly been CBT kinds of applications. And, and so, what's the uh, research showing? Um, is there, you know, head to head research against other CBT interventions, and and what are we seeing with VR? Right. So we did a number of studies with the fear of flying looking, comparing the virtual airplane to standard exposure therapy. So teaching the skills and then going and using a real airplane. And then the uh, behavioral avoidance test, a BAT is an old cognitive behavioral thing where you don't just base how your patient's doing on questionnaires or self-report. You see how they actually intervene interact with the feared object. Um, And often you do it before and after treatment. So after our studies, we would take people on a real airplane ride. And then that was part of the measure is how many people would agree to fly on the airplane because they had to avoid flying to get a flying phobia diagnosis prior to treatment. And in those studies, I think one of them went up to 12-month follow-up. And at 12-month follow-up, 90% 90% of people who had received either treatment flew, and we got them to rate their SUDs, subjective units of discomfort, while they were flying. And I can't remember, it was somewhere around like 30 to 40 on a zero to 100 scale. So it was manageable fear. And so I, that's, in some ways, what's most important is that it translates into real life In that very first study we did with the fear of heights using VR, at the end of therapy, seven out of 10 of people who had gone through the VR exposure told us that they had exposed themselves to real life height situations. And again, they had avoided height situations 
to have a diagnosis to get in the study. Seven out of 10 put themselves in real life height situations without us even asking them to. So that's what matters. It doesn't matter if you can ride on a virtual elevator if you can't get on a real one or ride on a virtual airplane if you can't get on a real one. Um, and so the so for the getting back to the state of the literature, what, what the VR for fear of flying has basically shown equivalence with using a real airplane. And again, so and we don't need to beat regular exposure therapy because I think it works very well. In the case of fear of flying, it's just so much easier with VR. Right. Um, and um, Greg Rieger it was the first author on a study that, that we were part of for active duty um, folks who had served in Iraq and Afghanistan with PTSD comparing virtual reality exposure therapy to prolonged exposure therapy, PE. And they worked equivalent, equivalently <laughs> equally well. <laughs> and um, they were looking for different predictors of which treatment seemed to work better for which person. Um, and that was more of a statistical technique. So it really... In the, in the ones that there have been head-to-head -head comparisons, it seems to be pretty equivalent to standard exposure therapy. Well, that's great news. I mean, uh, that it actually translates into real life and it's um, performing as well as uh, traditional uh, prolonged exposure. Um, welcome back, Keith. Um, can you hear us, Keith? I got kicked out. That was weird. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, so we were just talking about um, how you hear well. Me? Yes. We, can you hear us? Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I got kicked out. Okay. We were just talking about how um, traditional prolonged exposure and um, and VR exposure have similar outcomes in in some of the studies that Barbara's been involved in. So it's really exciting. Um, I'm wondering about if we could look at the future, Barbara, and uh, I know as a scientist, you might be, most scientists are reluctant to make uh, <laughs> wild claims about what could happen in the future without studying, but um, in our world, uh, it seems like a lot of the providers that we talk to are either 100% virtual or, or nearly so in their practices now, and some of them may not ever go back to meeting with people in person. Um, personally, I think there's a lot of information I get from sitting with a patient in person that I don't get in a screen, but do you, do you see, um, and please just answer as comfortable as you are here, because I don't want to put you on the spot here, but do you see the possibility that VR could be a component of what um, allows um, providers and, and patients to work together remotely? Absolutely. And actually, I have thought that way for years, maybe even longer than years. So, um, for example, if you have a pilot on a ship in the middle of a sea on the other side of the ocean who is all of a sudden scared of flying, and you don't happen to have a cognitive behavior exposure therapist on board. <laughs> um, if they had a VR head mounted display, and there are a lot of cheap ones out there now, um, and people are using them for gaming. So it's not totally unreasonable that people could have one um, or even one that a smartphone could, could be used in then that therapist doesn't necessarily have to be on the ship with them and they don't even necessarily have to be in the same hemisphere um, and that you could effectively treat them. So I've thought that for a long time, but it would just mean outfitting the user, the patient with what they need and being able to deliver the VR you know, reliably to wherever they are. So I think we're not quite there yet, but I certainly see that we could be. And given the fact that we're 
at least I have a pilot in the family, so I know a little bit about um, training and maintaining um, your your instincts and your 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 reaction times and so forth in the flight simulator. It seems like a no brainer to add a, a a feature to a simulator that would help people deal with those kinds of issues. Right. Yeah. I have another like slightly different spin on Will's question. Um, since you've been one of the leading researchers in VR for so long, I'm curious, like, what are some of the studies you would love to see happen if you had, you know, a couple hundred years to create studies? Like, where, where would you want, you know, what are some of the things you would want to try out in VR, um, just in the therapy space in general? Well, it's not necessarily time I need, but it's money. You give me, you give me money, and I can do those studies. So, okay. any listeners out know. there, any listeners want to contribute? I got, I got studies we can do. Um, so there are a lot of them. Um, one is in combination with medication. So, um, and there are a number of reasons I like VR for that. Um, we did a study, I guess it was published a long time ago, 2004, using decycloserine, which is an old, it's an old antibiotic. It's an NMDA partial agonist. And my colleagues had found that it facilitated the extinction of fear in a rodent model. And we wanted to, and it, like I said, it was an old antibiotic. So it'd been FDA approved for 50 years, so we could test it in humans, and we decided to test it using VR because usually when you test a medication with a psychotherapy component, the psychotherapy component's a little softer. But with VR, we could exactly control the stimulus that every patient got, and we could make sure that every patient got exactly the same stimulus as another patient. And at that point, we could make sure that it was only under the experimental drug conditions. They weren't likely to be exposed to it outside of the experimental drug conditions. Um, and we used the fear of heights and we you know, regulated it so everybody got exactly the same. So I, I love it for the methodological control of testing new medications. And we've, you know, talked to a number of, of drug studies about that. Um, I also like it, like, as we mentioned earlier, there are applications for substance use disorders. So, for example, if you have a drug that's supposed to reduce craving, we can test that in a virtual environment, you know, rather than the real environment that has more, more danger involved in it. Um, I also think that virtual reality has great potential as self-help. And I could, I've got those studies in my head that all we need is money, <laughs> money and a little bit of time, more money than time, maybe. So if we were to take that a little further with, you know, the idea of, of self-help and optimization, which is something that a lot of our um, community members are really interested in and, and Keith and I um, like to fiddle around with ourselves, um, what kinds of if you could design a study to look at um, all the different parameters or physiologic um, tracking, what what would you be most excited about looking at in terms of um, the setup? Would it be you know galvanic skin response? Would it be heart rate variability? Would it be uh, brain waves? I, I'm just so curious. What, what so would you be most? We're looking at all of those, and generally we're looking at them pre and post treatment. Um, so we've, we've done that in a number of our VR studies, um, and we've done it, we do it in our um, Emory Healthcare Veterans Program. We do psychophysiological studies, pre and post treatment, and actually, um, for one of our paradigms, we use the VR. We have created three two-minute standard clips of being in um, Iraq, Afghanistan, um, one's in a Humvee, one's in a, a alone, one's in a convoy, one's on foot patrol in a Middle Eastern city, and it increases in intensity. So we have a standard activation paradigm, and we're gathering, especially startle. 
So startle is one of the hallmark symptoms in exaggerated startle response in PTSD. And it's a, a translational measure. So we can do studies in animals and measure their startle response. And we can do studies in humans. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's really just a three neuron pathway. In humans, you probably don't realize it, but when we startle, we blink our eyes. So it's very easy to measure the startle response with an electrode under the eye. And we have been able to show um, that, for example, after when we use the virtual reality exposure therapy with the Iraq and Afghanistan veterans, that their psychophysiological reactivity to these cues decreased after nice. treatment. And it wow. stayed lower. And we also look at biomarkers. In this case, in that study, we looked at salivary cortisol. And we mm -hmm. could see that that decreased as well. So that and we're, we're seeing that as well in the Emory Healthcare Veterans Program. So that makes me really happy that the virtual reality treatment or the two weeks of treatment we give people in the, in the intensive outpatient program. With that treatment, their bodies are learning to become less reactive to cues. And I think that's part of what makes people with PTSD feel crazy. They can know they're not in a war zone yet their bodies are responding as if there's the same level of threat. So when their bodies are learning to become less reactive, I think, I think that's wonderful. Um, in some of our environments and treatment, we are gathering psychophysiological measures within the treatment session. Um, we did that in, I don't want to go through all the details, but we had a, a reconsolidation paradigm that, again, was really nice to use virtual reality for. The idea behind that is if you give someone a fear cue 10 minutes prior to the exposure therapy, in the animal studies and in the preclinical human studies, in their words, it prevented relapse a year later. So we could try that, and we did that with the fear of flying, and we could present the cue in the virtual reality 10 minutes before the session, um, either the airplane or just a neutral cue. We had a virtual living room, um, and we had psychophysiological measures all through that, and looking particularly, as you said, at galvanic skin response, how much we're sweating, and heart rate response. Hmm. Um, we can also... Um, and so we can use the whole big polygraph for that. But there is also a free program that you can use on your iPad or your iPhone. All you have to do is buy the electrode. It's called eSense. And what we found is with a dab of electrode gel or ointment, it is as accurate as the big polygraphs. And we're able, we use that with a lot of our patients and you can see it measures GSR, galvanic skin response, and you can see it come down. You can see it within a session. You can see it across sessions and we'll show it to the patients and see, you know, look, your body, you know, you, you're feeling different and, and your body's showing that it's feeling different too. And it's really very cool for patients to see okay. that kind of um, brings to mind a, an image of, um, you know, the, the firehouse or, uh, you know, the police station, or as you said, the pilot on the carrier on the other side of the world who just has a training uh, booth inside of their workplace that they can, you know, go and, and check and see if their startles exaggerated. If it is, maybe do a little training. Um, you know, I think about hospital workers, medical staff, you know, paramedics. I mean, the, 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 the list goes on of, of people who need on ongoing training um, just to keep your, your nervous system fit. Yep. I agree. Yeah. And, and well, we I'm curious as we, for, for assessment. I mean, so when, when people come or our war veterans come home from war, all they want is to get back to their families, to maybe forget about what happened, and they don't want to report that they're having any problems, and they think it's going to be fine. They just needed to get out of there. And then sometimes people do have problems reintegrating, and what I'm thinking is that we could use, for example, that virtual reality activation paradigm with the psychophysiological measures when people come back to maybe right. predict 
who's going to not have any problems reintegrating or who might have problems. And then, you know, just we can do a little bit of work to make it easier for them without all of the sequela of, you know, maybe too right. much drinking or, or marital problems or other stuff down the road. Sorry, Keith, you were. I love that. <laughs> Um, oh yeah, I was just wondering as we start to wrap up for providers who want to start getting involved with VR, um, you know, what's the process? Is it like basically they, they're going to get a certain specific VR headset and they're buying software online somewhere that they just are basically using on their computer with that headset? Or like, how does this all work for people just want, who are like, yeah, I can't wait to get involved with VR? Right. Um, and so that's, I mean, it's a, I'm glad you brought that up. So for most of your listeners, I mean, maybe they're interested in VR and that's why they're listening. Um, but even if, you know, I've had people tell me after, you know, I've talked about it. Yeah, I'm not going to do it. But at least it's good to know about it if your patients ask about it and stuff going on. Some people do want to do it. And I would say you got to be trained in CBT and exposure therapy first. It scares me if people aren't trained in exposure therapy and they get the VR and they think now they're an exposure therapist. Um, it's you know kind of like a story years ago. Um, I was working with a patient on the unit, on the inpatient unit. She had panic disorder and agoraphobia. We'd been working really well. I had to go out of town. I asked the nurse to just do what we had done the day before. They got in the tunnel patient panic, nurse panicked, and they both ran back to the unit. <laughs> so you don't want to do, you know, bad VR therapy is just bad therapy. So you only want to do it if you really know about exposure therapy and how to be therapeutic with it. Um, so I'm glad I disclosed my relationship with Virtually Better uh, earlier because they have been in the business now, what, since 1996 um, in creating virtual environments and training therapist in using the virtual environments and they've got a website and a number of the different suites the phobia suites and all the different things um, there there are a number of folks out there but my main and with virtually better we've written treatment manuals that go with each of the applications um, but my main caution is don't try this at home if you're not an exposure therapist or get training in exposure therapy first got it so so great so assuming it is an exposure therapist that's already trained in that. Then the next step is like, so virtually better sounds like a software company and they also need to get the hardware, right? Right. But they'll, um, I mean, you can, you can buy everything through virtually better. Oh, okay. Yeah. You Great. get the whole system, a whole turnkey system and, and training too. Yeah. Great. Cool. Wow. This has well, been really we, uh, yeah. educational. Yeah. Very I, educational. Um, Thank you for being with us. We have a question that we ask all of our guests uh, toward the end that, that we'd like to pose to you now is um, that if you had a billboard and uh, you could put a paragraph on it that every person in the world would see once in their lifetime, what would you like them to know? Oh boy, I didn't really prepare too much for this. <laughs> um, my first reaction, I, don't, I might just go ahead and stick with it and it's short and sweet. Listen to your mother. <laughs> Good advice. <laughs> and, and if my boys are listening to this, <laughs> my, boy, my boys are good about listening to their mother, actually. <laughs> That's funny. Thanks, Barbara. Thanks so much for being on the show. Thank you. It was fun.